Amen. Thank you, Chad, for sharing with us this morning. Turn your Bibles for a few moments today to Philippians. Philippians is the book of joy, and I want to share with you today about joy. Because, you know, when we watch the news, it's nothing but seem like troublesome times. We read uh, all around the world, and, and people are seeking peace. They want some kind of inner peace. And uh, so I'm speaking to a lot of people today uh, uh, outside this building, out uh, as we also, as we are broadcast on, our, on the Internet, uh, who, who want to have personal uh, peace. And so uh, that just seems like something that's escaped us today. Now, Paul is going to give us a challenge here. Uh, the verse that I'm going to share with you, or the verses that I'm going to share with you today, ought, should be very familiar to, uh, uh, to all of us. And so I want to talk to you today about how that we are to stand fast and where we are to stand fast as well in order to experience this personal peace that he's talking about. You know, there's so much uncertainty today uh, in this world that we live in. Things seem to be... Uh, changing rapidly every day. Uh, we're in a position now that we never dreamed a, a few months ago that we would be in today. Uh, so it's a troublesome time. And, and there are circumstances, as people deal with the inner turmoil, uh, there are circumstances that, that crowd around them and crowd around us today. And so what is happening, the circumstances, things that we deal with, oftentimes control our life. And that's certainly uh, not the way it's to be. We are to have a joy, and Paul is challenging us, actually. We're to have a joy no matter what's going on. But you see, many people today don't have this joy. They don't have this peace, and, uh, and there's, uh, there's no settled peace down in their heart. Well, that's what I want to talk to you about today and give you a challenge today uh, as well. But you know, the good news is, the most glorious good news is, as you and me as believers... Those of us who know Christ as Savior, been born again, and, and I pray that you have. I pray that you've had that relationship with Him, and you know that Christ is in your heart. Because the Bible tells us in the book of Romans, chapter 5, that, that we are justified by faith, and then we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So we can have peace with God, the Bible tells us. <coughs> Excuse me, that's for every born-again believer we can have uh, this peace. So my prayer is that you have made your peace with God. Do you know Him uh, in a personal way? So it's altogether different to have the peace of God, and uh, this is what we're going to talk about as well. Uh, so there's a contrast that we're going to look at, and, and uh, but I just want to read one verse from Philippians chapter four, verse number one. <laughs> but keep your Bibles open because we're going to look at some other uh, verses as well. Philippians chapter four, verse one. He says, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, he missed these people. He said, my joy and my crown. Now look what he says. So stand fast in the Lord. So he's giving us a challenge right here that I want us to look at today of stand fast. Where do we stand fast? Not in the world, not in what the world has to offer, not in material things, but we are to stand fast, he says, and Philippians chapter 4, verse 1, he says, We are to stand fast in the Lord. Father, I pray that you'll bless the reading of your word uh, to the understanding of our hearts and minds. We thank you for these verses that, that remind us that there is a peace, there is a joy that we can experience no matter what the circumstances are around us in this world. Uh, we can still have an innermost peace that you give us because when you come into our hearts, you set up residence in our life and then you give us a joy that just passes all understanding. We can't even understand it all, but for that, uh, we are grateful. And I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> now drop down, if you would, a few verses down to number six. And I want to I show you something here that we'll examine real carefully. There's a contrast here uh, between peace on one hand and worry on the other hand. A lot of people are worried today. There are people who, uh, and rightly so, they perhaps have been furloughed from their jobs or, or maybe even laid off for some. Uh, I talk, spoke with my uh, cousin this week in Fort Thomas, Kentucky, and they uh, have shut her business down completely, not to be brought back. I uh, worked there 20-something years, and she's worried. She's out of a job now. Uh, her and her sister both worked at the same place. And so there are people who are worried today because of uh, the uncertain uh, future. 
But he's giving us a contrast right here between peace on one hand and then worry on the other. Look what he says in verse number 6. He said, be careful for nothing. Now, another translation from that, the NIV is, that you might have, he's telling us here not to worry about anything. So you see there's a contrast there between worry on one hand and then peace on the other, and they're the exact opposites. The word worry there literally means to, uh, to pull apart, to pull apart something. This is what worry means. So there's a contrast. Now notice what it says in verse number 7 about the peace of God. He says, well, keep your hearts and your mind. So think about this. Worry pulls apart. Worry takes our mind and our heart and literally pulls them apart. But now peace does something different, don't it? Peace brings together. Peace joins things. And this is what God is going to give us. He wants us to have in your life. So do you ever worry about things? Sure you do. We all worry about and, you know, I was coming out here today, and I'd watch the news this morning, the early news, and, and I just, uh, <clears throat> I was thinking about some things that was said this morning. Uh, some young guy that he and his wife started a business, and they invested all the resources they had in this business, uh, and now they were shut down, of course, and he said that they couldn't afford to pay the rent for the building and go on, and and he said all that we had, evidently, he didn't get his help like he thought he was going to from the government. And so he was, he was really worried. And I thought about that as I came out here today. Uh, he, he, is, he was just, there's more and more like him. That, you know, there's a, there's a lot of folks just, just like him. And so I thought, here, I, and I, you know, I worry about that as well for him. I'm thinking, here's a guy, he and his wife, they put all their, their resources together, everything they had to do this, and now... It's probably gone down the drain, every bit of it. So I thought, you know, I'm going out here today to talk to people about not worrying, and here I am uh, worrying myself. And so sometimes we, we worry about things. Uh, uh, someone has made the statement, the spiritual biography of many people in the world is hurry, worry, and then bury. And, and I guess those three uh, go together. Because, you know, worry can certainly cause a lot of problems. And so the Lord doesn't want us to... Uh, to be worrying about these things. Worry will cause us to have uh, physical problems as we, as we deal with the life. There are those who worry, and then that turns into uh, uh, to depression. A lot of people suffer from uh, uh, depression, you know, and they, uh, they don't have the, uh, we don't have the freedoms that we once had. We're limited down, a lot of things that we can do, and, and perhaps even in the future for a while, there may be uh, some things that we're limited that, that before we took for granted. You know, I'm never, I don't believe I'll take anything for granted anymore. The privilege we've had before just getting up and going to Lowe's or Walmart's or anywhere we wanted to go and not have to wear a mask or not, not worry. You could go in and visit someone in the health care facility or, or go to the hospital and do blood work and all those things. Now, now we're standoffish when we come to those things because we worry about that. We don't want to uh, uh, be exposed to something that we might get, and this is a, a terrible thing that's going. And so... It bothers us, our physical well-being. And, you know, worry will also cause high blood pressure. There are just so many things that's affiliated uh, with that when we worry. Ulcers, a lot of people, you know, deal with ulcers in life, and they'll tell you, yes, yeah, it's, it's because I have worried about things. I, I was reading an article once by Dean Ornish. He was a, a cardiologist, a well-known cardiologist, and he made a very good point in his article that he wrote. He said, uh, that your emotional well-being has a great deal to do with your physical well-being. So in other words, he's saying that worry can cause all kinds of physical problems, and, and we know it can now. Well, surveys and all that and, and dealing with people through the years, we certainly recognize that to be true. So it can cause emotional problems. Then when you have emotional problems, that causes emotional stress. That works on you probably harder than anything else because that can also work on your spiritual uh, problems as well. We begin questioning God about things oftentimes. You know, I love the Sermon on the Mount. The greatest sermon that's ever been preached on this earth was preached by none other than our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from the Sermon on the Mount. And Jesus uh, had told them there about not worrying. He says, don't worry about your life, don't what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink, uh, nor for your body, uh, what you put on. Uh, he said, is life not more than meat and the body the raiment? But then he goes on to say something I'd really like. He said, behold the fowls of the air. 
For they sow not, neither do they reap, nor do they gather into barns. But yet your heavenly Father, what does He do? He takes care of them, does He feeds them. And then He asks a question, Are you not much better than they? I read a little thing once I thought was interesting. It said, said the robin to the sparrow, I should really like to know why these restless human beings rush about and worry so. Said the sparrow to the robin, Well, I guess that it must be that they have no heavenly father such as cares for you and me. And so, you know, is that not how, how we act sometimes? It's just like we're on our own and we have no heavenly father who watches over us or cares. You know, our Lord said, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. No matter what you go through in life, he's right there. So what we're dealing with right now, we're going to learn a lot of lessons from this. You know, you see families doing more things together. They're eating together now. You know, most of the time families don't eat together like we used to. And my and I are growing up. There was a certain time and we all gathered at the table. And through the years, uh, we, we don't eat together like we used to. There are now families, I, I was watching one family on TV, they said they're, we're playing games, we're playing a lot of games together. And, and so there's a lot of positive things that's going to come out of this. There's a lot of negativity, but there's also uh, a lot of positive things that's going to come out. And we're going to learn some lessons, and we need to learn some lessons as well. Jesus says, which of you by taking thought, that is, which of you by worrying, can add one cubit unto his statue? And then he says, Why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. In other words, he's telling us not to worry. Now here's what happens when we worry. When we worry about things, then that is a distrust. When you get right down to it, you think about it, that is a distrust in God. And so no wonder when Jesus was teaching through the mountain. He would say again and again, do not worry, do not worry, don't worry. You know, this is what he said all the way through because it's a distrust in God. In other words, it's a lack of confidence that God is who he is and, and he'll do what he says he will do. God gives us many, many promises in our Bible and God is not lax concerning his promises and he's going to fulfill that. And so we need to get out of the wilderness of worry into the palace of peace. And, you know, he sees every need in our life. All these things that's happening in the world today did not take him by surprise. He knows everything that's going on today. And he wants to work through our life. Now, there's just a couple things I want to share with you from this. The first thing I want to share with you in this journey of the challenge that he gives us, that we're to rejoice. Look at verse number four. He says, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say, rejoice. Now, the book of Philippians is known as a book of joy. As a matter of fact, when we get back into this building, uh, hopefully here soon, things are really changing rapidly, you know, uh, uh, about every day, so it won't be long now, it doesn't look like. Uh, there Maybe there are some things that we'll have to do differently, but that's okay until it gets back to somewhat normal. Uh, but the book of Philippians is a book that I'm going to go through because it's a book about joy and, and happiness, the contrast and all this stuff. And, you know, it's hard for us to have joy right now, is it not? I think all of you would agree with me. It's hard to have joy right now. And so why is that? Why is it so difficult for us right now to have joy? Because of the circumstances that's going on in this whole world, not just our state or our county, but the whole world. So then that means that we're letting these circumstances control our life. Is that not what's happening? You know, with all that's going on? Now, the Bible teaches us that we are not to live a circumstance-controlled life. We're to live a life controlled by God. And that's what he tells us in the chapter 4, uh, chapter four verse number 1 there. He says, stand fast. And that is a military word. It would be like soldiers would be guarding something perhaps, and they were to stand fast there. They were not to leave their post there whatsoever. And this is what he's telling us. He's telling us to... Uh, to stand fast, and so we stand fast, not in what this world has to offer, not in that. This is a challenge he's giving us, Paul is giving us here. Now, we must also remember where Paul is when he is writing this. Paul is in jail when he's writing this. He's not in a palace somewhere. 
you know, it's easy to write things or it's easy to be positive when things are going good, but what happens then when circumstances do come along and change things? How do we deal with it, you know? And some people get depressed, some people worry and all this. And what this lesson is telling us today that, that we're just to trust God. Just give it all to Him. So he says that we are to stand fast in the Lord. Be unmovable, what he has had to say, just like a soldier would stand his ground. And then in verse number 2 he says, be of the same mind in the Lord. And then he goes down in verse number 4, we were just were, he says, rejoice in the Lord. Now God has a monopoly on joy, I can promise you that. And there is a difference between happiness and joy. The Bible really doesn't promise us happiness, the Bible promises us something greater to happen, uh, than happiness, and that is a joy, a joy that we can have in our life. No matter what the circumstances are in life, we can have a joy, our innermost peace, because of who we uh, belong to. And so happiness is drawn from the word happenstance. In other words, if things are going okay, then, then we're pretty much happy. Well, how about when things aren't going okay, when things aren't going like we uh, what do we do then? Well, we worry, and we do those things, and we're not to do that. So he gives us a challenge here. In verse number 4, he gives us a challenge, he says there, to rejoice in the Lord. And so we're to be positive. We are to look on the bright side of things. You know, it's easy to be negative. We can look at situations and all kinds of things, and, and you know, we... we we can be negative about things or we can be positive. We should be able to find something good in everything. And so there are so many lessons that I believe that our nation, for instance, the nation we live in in our state, I think we're going to learn some lessons through this that, uh, that will make us stronger and better people when we, once we go through all this because circumstances do change, you know, things do change. And, and so what we're to do, we're to celebrate God Every day, <laughs> you know, no matter what's going on in the world, we're to celebrate. And he tells us there, we are to rejoice. He says, rejoice in the Lord. How do we do that? How do we rejoice? We rejoice in the Lord. That's how uh, we do it. And so we think, well, look, you know, Paul, <clears throat> Paul's writing this letter, and he's probably on a tropical island. No, he wasn't. <laughs> Paul was in, and went in jail. And Paul experienced a lot of tough stuff in his life. He went through a lot in his life, but yet he's able to, I'm, I'm, I can rejoice in the Lord. You know, why, you know why he could do that? Because he had harmony with God. And that's what God wants to have with us. He wants us to be uh, uh, on the right key, on the same key, basically. If we were talking about music, he wants us to be in harmony with him. So verse 4, he says, again, I say, uh, rejoice. And so it's almost like that he stopped for a minute here and thought, you know, uh, he thought a bit of what was ahead of his life. And he said, hey, I'm going to say it again. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. And he said, I don't know what's ahead. He didn't know what was going to happen to him. He thought his life may even be over the very next day after all this. But then he would say, but again, I say, rejoice. What a wonderful man Paul was. I heard about a little Sunday school child who was riding the, the church bus back home from Sunday school, and, and the teacher had given every one of them a verse of Scripture, and her verse of Scripture was from Mark chapter 11, uh, verse number 22, which says, Have faith in God. Have faith in God. So this little girl, as she was getting off the bus, there was a big uh, gust of wind that blew, and the paper that she had in her hand that said, uh, Have uh, that have faith in God blew away from her. It blew out of her hand and she said, oh no, oh no, my faith in God just blew away. You know, when the storms of life come, it's easy for us. It's just, it's just easy for us sometimes to, to let our faith blow away. We don't understand what's going on and we begin questioning God and all this. And You know, it's, it, it's just like a, we must be connected to the Savior. You know, you can have a, the most beautiful faucet in your house, in your, in your kitchen sink, or uh, just a, a beautiful faucet there. But you know what? If you're not connected to the water line that comes into your house, that faucet is not going to be of any use to you. You know, we must be in harmony. We must be tuned in. 
You know, we have so many people today that want the faucet, but they miss the connection. We're to be connected every day with the God in heaven. And so it's only as we are connected to him is he able to work through our life and bring us uh, this joy and this peace that only he could do. You know, even when Jesus was facing the cross, you know, he went to the cross for your sins and my sins. And, and the time that he was facing the cross, he says, may my joy remain in you. And so that is not just a regular joy that we experience. You know, God does things in the supernatural, does he not? And so we have a, a, a supernatural joy that we can have through, uh, through him. And so, you know, I, I, have, I have been around and met many people. And when you look at their life, they, they basically had about every right to be discouraged and, uh, by seeing every reason to be down in their life. And, but yet, you know, there was such a, such a radiance of joy and peace that come from people that I've had the opportunity through the years when I was chaplain at the hospital to, to minister to. And, and you would look at their life and what was going on or their family life and and they would have every right, you know, you would think, to, to be discouraged or to be depressed. But yet that wasn't the way many of them were. They were, they, they were experiencing this supernatural joy. That's, what, that's the kind of joy that God wants to give us. Not just the regular joy here and there. He wants to give us a supernatural joy. And we have that because He is the source. You see, he, he's the source for everything in your life, for you and I living the Christian life day by day, experiencing him day by day, being in harmony with him. And when we're, when we're there with him, then we're going to experience this joy no matter what goes on around us, no matter what the circumstances are. I don't care what it is because we are, we are in him. Now, the second thing that he challenged us with in verse number five is that we are to let our moderation know. In other words, we are to be yielding to him. And that word there uh, means uh, gentleness or graciousness. Uh, he said, let your, your willingness, be, let your moderation be known uh, unto all men. And so we are to be yielded to the God in heaven. And he's not talking about, not talking here about giving up any of our spiritual convictions you know, I know what I believe and why I believe it, and I stand on that, I, and I'm not going to sway from it. He's not talking about giving up our, uh, he's talking about us yielding to the God in heaven. The Lord, he says, at hand in verse uh, number five, he's right here. So he was experiencing, he was, Paul lived, was living so close to God, he was experiencing him all the time. That's what God wants for your life and my life. He wants us to experience him, not just on Sunday when we gather here at, uh, at the church, he wants us to experience him tomorrow as you're in your home perhaps uh, or maybe some of you on your job or wherever you might be. He wants you to sense his presence just like right now. He wants you to sense his presence with you as we have gathered here today in our automobiles to worship him. So he's a wonderful God and he tells us in verse number six, he gives us a challenge about praying that we should be we should be praying about everything. He says, be, be careful for nothing, but in everything, notice there if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, he says, in everything by prayer. Friend, prayer is the key to everything about your life and my life. There's a beautiful song, and in that song, it says, I can't, I can't walk on water, but I know someone who does. I can't calm the sea, but I know someone who does. Some call him Savior, but then the singer says, I call him Jesus. And so, you know, there's things in life that we can't do. There's things that we attempt to do. You know, I, I can't save anyone. <laughs> you know, I can tell someone about Jesus, and so I can tell them someone who will uh, save them. And I can't walk on water, or I can't heal people. I can't do these things, but I know someone who will and someone who does, and it's Jesus Christ. He wants to be Savior of your life. He also wants to be Lord of your life every day. So when we're connected to him as Lord and Savior, not just Savior, sadly many people just want him to be the Savior, because they don't want to die and go to a devil's hell. 
but they don't want the Lord to be Lord of their life every day because they want to direct their own life. They want to call their own shots and decide what they want to do without consulting a God in heaven. Well, he wants to be, he wants to direct our past because he knows what's best for us. He knows the direction our life needs to go in and he knows how to get us there. And so we just, by faith, we trust him. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul did. And this is a challenge that Paul is giving to you and I today that we're to just trust this God in heaven. Trust this God who's sufficient about everything that we deal with in life. And pray. And he tells us the last thing there that we are to, uh, to pray. We're to just believe he'll do what he says he'll do. And it's a promise that Jesus has made that he will do that. He'll give us a joy, give us a peace. No matter what's going on in this world, we can experience that when we are in harmony with him. We're going to have a moment of invitation. Bow your hearts before the Lord right now. and Perhaps, there's, perhaps you're not experiencing this joy that the Bible talks about that we can have. You're not experiencing that nearness. You say, well, I'm a Christian. I, I'm saved. I've, I've invited Jesus Christ to come into my heart and, and forgive my sins. I've done that. I'm saved. But I'm just, not, I'm just not experiencing what you're talking about today and what Paul is talking about. I'm not experiencing that in my life. Maybe you're out of harmony with God. So my question would be to you while you sit there in your car today, Who's in charge of your life? Who's directing your life? Are you doing it or are you following the leadership of a God in heaven who knows what's best? You see, he knows what's best for your life and my life. And he knows what it's going to take to get us from where we are to where he wants us to be. And so by faith, we just trust him to do that. And then we allow him, when we do that, we're allowing him to go to work in our life. And he's going to bring a lot of things into our life. And one of those things is what we're talking about today. He's going to bring a joy in your life. Maybe some of you aren't experiencing that joy. And perhaps it's because you're not in harmony. You're not in harmony with God. Right where you're sitting today, perhaps you need to, to recommit your life anew to serving him. Say, Lord, I, I, I'm a Christian. I know I'm saved, but Lord, I've I just been doing my own thing. And I want you to be on the throne of my life. I want you to be number one in my life. And all these other things will have their, they'll have their place in life. But I want you to be number one first in my life. And then these other things we'll have will be things that will bring honor and glory to him. We'll use them in that sense. That's what I pray for you. Draw close to him. Experience that joy that only God can give. The world can offer us all these things that the world offers but it cannot give us a lasting joy, a lasting peace. Only the God in heaven can do that. His name is Jesus. Father, I pray for those today who have gathered in this place. Perhaps if there will be one out there in their automobile today who has never received you as Lord and Savior, who's never asked for forgiveness of sin and invited you to come into our heart. Father, when we do that, we know that that when we sincerely ask you to forgive us of all of our sin and come into our heart, that your spirit comes into our spirit. That's supernatural. You do that. And Father, I pray if they have not done that, that'll be something they'll do right now while they're sitting there in their automobile. And then allow you to work through their life to know that they're in well, your hands now. We're your child. Before we were a creation and now we've become a child. We're born into the family of God. And you want what's best for your children. We thank you and praise you for that. So I pray perhaps for other decisions of people gathered here today that as they look at their life, that, that to see sometimes that it's so easy for us to kind of just run our own life and do our own thing. But that's not how it's to be. You want to be in charge of our life. You want us to look to you because when we do that, then we're going to, experiencing, we're going to experience the blessings that you hand out to us. One of those is joy, contentment, and peace, even in the midst of a difficult time. Thank you for that. So I pray perhaps there'll be decisions made right here today on our premises during this invitation in Christ's name.
Jesus, our blessed Redeemer, He's only a prayer away. He's only a prayer away. He's only a prayer away. God will. Thank you, Chad. Thank you, musicians. And thank you for being here today. Uh, you don't have to worry about this field over here when it rains. We had some rain last night, and that field is hard as a rock, so uh, uh, it won't be muddy or anything like that. You don't have to worry about that. And so I'm glad that you've come today. And what we need to do before we leave, and I'm going to count to three, and on three, we need to greet each other. All right, so I'm going to count to three, and you can toot your horn at everybody in this parking lot. All right, one, two, three. All right, okay. That's one way we can greet each other. We may not be able to shake hands and bump and all that other stuff, but we can blow our horn because we're church family. We love one another. We miss being together in here, but aren't you glad that we have this uh, means by which we can come to this church and, and have our worship time together, even though we're in our car. So thank you for being here today, and especially for those of you who are visiting with us. Uh, we're certainly delighted that you have come to worship, and we pray that you'll come back and worship with us, and it won't be long we'll be gathering in our, in our sanctuary again, and we certainly want you to be a part of that time. So I pray that you'll be safe this week. If you want any of these magazines we have or anything, you just call me this week, and you can swing by, and I'll take care of that for you. All right, thank you for being here today, and thank you, Chad, for sharing our special music today and for all you involved that make this a special time. All right, God bless you as you go.